We are the biggest, we are the largest, we are the highest, we are the tallest, we are the greatest African spiritual platform called us Consciousness Family. The people are called the Pearls. Myself, your adorable host, call me Queen Hadasha, call me Empress Makida, a woman with one million names. I love, love, and hate, hate. My people, I welcome you to another great episode. Today, we are going to talk about one of the pillars of this platform that is consciousness confusion i abasa our baby and our christ and our christ consciousness and i hear and I, that's what we are going to talk about today the topic is christ consciousness and the coming crisis that's what we are going to discuss today that is huge let's welcome one of our fathers on set be my friend and brothers depends on your age i on set and let's see what happens today uh papa please we welcome you to revelations thank you great today is your first time on this big platform so please kindly pay obeisance to the followers i mean say hello to them introduce yourself to us before we come to the main issue okay well hello everybody my name is max varden and um i'm to describe myself a just another nomad looking for the well of truth on the horizon so hopefully today we will be able to share some truths and examine them in the context of what is happening in our world today and what has been happening over a number of centuries which is leading to a crisis point at this time okay we welcome you sir Abusia, your guest for today, I think is going to be great. Mo amo te say me ano. You people should borrow English. Now we all balance our balancing, and those who can translate it for some of us, write it in three. Ewe dagbani dag name them. Write it the ga ga dangbe ube tumi atra 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 waho. Na yendani eho no muso so ayi linguistics. French or German, I welcome each and every one of us to another great episode. Today, our topic is Christ, consciousness, and the coming crisis. That's what we are going to discuss. Papa, I have welcomed you already, but I want to understand something small before we get into your topic. You said um, some things has happened before. Yes. Before now. Oh, definitely. Um, the history of the world goes back. Okay. Can many, you, can you give us a bit? Well, basically, what I'm saying is that uh, the trends and the events of today have been building up for a long time. There has been agency that has been orchestrating the world to get us to where we are today. Yeah. Um, things are not, have not just happened randomly and by chance to get the world to the numerous crisis points that we face. So this is where I'm coming from. If we are to start on to look at the origins of the present day crisis, we have to go back several centuries to even before Roman times. But for the purposes of our discussion, it would be good to maybe cut off at Romans, the Roman Empire, just before Christ came into the world. No, uh, we want to have a bit mm -hmm. of the past, yeah, or okay. the past history. If you can go back, 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 where mm -hmm. you think you can start from, okay. you have to bring us from a point Okay. So we are able to understand what we are going to discuss. Okay, fair enough. The essential dynamics of our time today is that mankind, as always, is faced with a choice where we can go towards mammon, the material world, or we can go towards mana, which I'm using as a proxy for the gifts of God, the gifts of creation. This is a choice we face all the time in terms of the decisions that we make. Yeah, we have to understand that humans are agents of the Most High, and our job here is to 
be of service to others and to ourselves and to God. And the way we do this is by being conscious of the choices we make that can either make the world a more difficult place or make the world a better place. So this particular battle between evil and good, between mammon and manna, has been most readily appreciated or exemplified by the story of money, money. If we go back to Roman times, so I'll start from there. Most people know of Julius Caesar, who was a leader of ancient Rome. And most people also know that he was murdered by his fellow senators. What I don't think most people know is the reason he was murdered. The purported reason was that the other senators felt he was becoming too ambitious and he wanted to make himself emperor. But that is just the pretext that was put out at the time. The real reason was that before Julius Caesar came to power, there were individuals in Roman society, yeah, who shall we call the money lenders. These were the people who created tokens of money, which they lent out to people at very high interest rates and so on. So they were rich and they controlled the Roman economy. Julius Caesar saw this and because of his love for the ordinary man, he decided that there was a better way which would make life easier for the ordinary man. So what Julius Caesar did was he took away the power of these men to create money and he centralized that power in the Roman state. So for the first time there was a single coin representing money in the Roman Empire. Yeah? One coin which was issued by the Roman state. This made life a lot easier for everybody um, because they could be, be, you know, work and be paid in the Roman coin and so on and accumulate wealth and stuff. But of course it came at the cost of the profits of the previous moneyed class. So <laughs> they were the ones who decided, no, we can't abide this situation. This man has to go. Yeah. So they were the ones who basically inspired or conspired with the senators to murder Julius Caesar, thinking that they could then get back the power over money and therefore over the common man. And that battle between money, yeah, which is an instrument of Satan, the devil, the fallen angels and what have you, that battle between money and freedom and independence and uh, autonomy has been going on since then. Again, people may remember that Jesus actually made reference to the Roman coin. Or give what belongs to Caesar to Caesar. Exactly. Of course, by this time, Julius Caesar had passed and there, were, there was another Caesar and so on. Caesar simply means king, yeah, who, whoever occupied the uh, throne, as it were, at the time. So <coughs> there were Roman coins in circulation. And this is, again, one of the core choices that we make every day as humans, whether we are rendering unto God that which is God's, or are we rendering unto Caesar also that which is God's? This is the problem that we have, and it's exacerbating the challenges that we face in this world. Um, everybody, you know, most people in Ghana today are having a hard time, you know, because of the policies of the uh, leaders of the country. We, many people, now have turned to the church, seeking 
salvation, well, not so much salvation, <laughs> seeking emancipation, especially financial emancipation. They are seeking miracles. So we go to church and we pray, hoping that God will hear our prayer and somehow make money manifest into our lives. And we forget that the way to get money, which is an instrument of Caesar, is not to pray to God. God is not interested in money. But God has equipped us with the mind, the brain, the, the body, hands and feet, and the skills that we can learn in order to apply ourselves to make money. Yeah? So <laughs> we are living in a world where we are experiencing cross winds in terms of what people are doing and the expectation that they have, which is wrong. The money. Okay, so um, uh, please, I, let me, I want to understand this part, or I want us to understand this part. Means mammon represent the devil and manna represent God. Is yes. that correct? Yes. Okay, so this mammon and this God thing and the Caesar thing, yes. you find all these stories in the Bible. Well, the story of Caesar per se is not it in is the Bible, but the representation of Caesar. And uh, the fact that Caesar. Jesus quoted from it and yes. said, give what is Caesar to Caesar. Yes. And you, when you talk Caesar, then you are talking about the coin that stands yes. for money and yes. represents mammon. Yes. It means that story is in the Bible. Oh, yes, definitely. So um, in this case, mm -hmm. um, um, where do we place the Bible? When it comes to these two, two, uh, two stories, should we, because the Bible is saying that we should free from the devil. Yes. And this same Bible is saying we should give what belongs to the devil to the devil. So yes. how do we calculate this? <laughs> it's very simple. Um, we should be clear where our priorities and our values lie. Money is a tool. And in the modern world where basically it's a token of value, it's a convenient device to exchange value to get goods and so on and so forth. That's all it is. Then <coughs> we should understand that it has its place. But to dedicate our lives, as many people do, to the accumulation of money, that is not what we are here for. We are for. supposed to do. That's not what we are supposed to do. You understand? And there is an understanding where if we focus on being of service, yeah, which is how we serve God, in as much as you have done it to the least of your brethren, you have done it to me. Mm -hmm. If we focus on being of service to others, the money will come pretty much automatically because that service will have value. Um, yes. Please, when you, you pick the Bible yourself, yes. not what people think, Right. Where do you place the Bible? Do you place the Bible as the word of God that will take us to heaven or you place it as a history book? Where do you place the Bible? Well, it's a bit of both. But we also, I think, have to uh, expand our understanding that <laughs> the word of God um, may be found in the scriptures, but it is also found in nature. Yeah. Nature is the first face of God. God created the natural world before man came to write the Bible. So we, we, sh we, we shouldn't focus solely on the scriptures. We should also focus on the manifest word of God as it has been expressed in the natural world that we live in. What this also means yeah, is that we need to learn to respect the natural world, to learn to respect nature. We should learn to respect the earth, the planet. And our forefathers did this, and they had many uh, customs and so on that made sure that nature was respected. Unfortunately, we have adopted the ways of the white man who has been disconnected from nature for a long time and under the guise or the mandate of capitalism, we have been raping the planet, we have been poisoning the planet, we have been destroying the planet in search of profit. 
And this is where you can see the devil is doing a great job in getting humanity to destroy the world, the one world that we call home, in the quest for profit. And we know this, how this is playing out in Ghana today, with all the uh, galamse that's going on and the destruction of the forest, the, the poisoning of the water bodies. And um, just the other day, I was reading how um, polluted water is being used to prepare food for people to eat. You know, so that, that's an, another issue we will come to maybe one day. But what we want to get straight here is this: someone who is focused, or someone who is focusing on the universe or the nature or the trees, water bodies, and all that, mm -hmm. and has left the Bible behind, <laughs> and someone mm -hmm. who has also left these things behind and is holding on to Bible. Mm -hmm. Who should we focus on? We shouldn't focus on either <laughs> of the two. We should focus on our relationship with God. That is what our responsibility is. Um, mm -hmm. Both these people you've described yeah, are out of balance. <laughs> because when we walk, we don't walk on one leg. We walk on two legs. Yeah? That's the way we keep our balance. And it is the same with the two pillars of scripture and nature. Scripture feeds our mind. It gives us insight. It gives us ideas and so on. Nature feeds our bodies and our souls. And, you know, we cannot live without eating. That physical food doesn't come from the Bible. It comes from the soil whether it is directly through a plant or indirectly through an animal that feeds on a plant and so on. So these are the lessons that we need to have taken on board. And part of our challenge in Af Africa generally today is that people pick up the word of God, the scripture, and they read the scripture. Very often they don't interpret the scripture correctly and they turn to faith, praying 20 hours a day and so on for what I don't know. Whether they expect God to come and do a job to pay them <laughs> or, you know, the, 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 the word that is in the Bible is that we have to be productive. I mean, recently, myself and uh, some friends who do Bible study and so on, we've been looking at the story of the vine, yeah, in uh, uh, is it John 13, I think it is, okay, where Jesus says, I, I am, the, am vine. the vine, and my father is the husband man, and you are the branches, okay? So the branches take their nourishment from the vine. But, says Jesus, if the branch is not productive, it is cut off and cast away. It's if it is not productive. But I, I, even I, if it is productive, the husband man will come and prune it so that it is more productive. And what this is saying is that even if we are on the frequency of God and we are living our lives according to God's commandments, we should understand that it does not mean there will be no challenges because it is through adversity, it is through the challenges and so on that we grow, that we become more productive, that we learn the virtues of patience and perseverance and persistence and love and so on. Okay, I asked that question yes. because of uh, because of what you, you said about money and our mm -hmm. salvation or our freedom. Yes. So the, the Bible, yes. should we take everything in it very seriously or some of them is actually not important? Well, there are degrees of importance. So, for example, the uh, genealogy, okay, where it says X begat Y begat Z begat A and so on and so forth. 
that probably doesn't have much relevance in your and my everyday life. But certainly if you want to trace your ancestry or somebody wants to trace their connections and so on, then that becomes important. So those kinds of historical data are useful for specific research purposes and for certain understandings. But mostly what we are required to do yeah, is to focus on the commandments that we have been given on how to live our lives. On how to live our lives. You are watching the biggest, the largest, the highest, the greatest, and the tallest. I'm asking, I keep asking about this because you made it clear that the money is for the devil. Well, I've said it's an instrument of the it's devil. It's an instrument of the devil. But again, let us understand that God is supreme. God is almighty. supreme, almighty. And God can use anything at all. Including the devil himself. Including the devil himself and the devil's instruments to further his will. To further his word. <laughs> yes. Okay, so let's leave that. Now, I'm asking all these questions because yeah. when you come to the Bible, it mm -hmm. has said clearly mm -hmm. that you quoted, G uh, give what belongs to Caesar yes. to Caesar. Yes. Then, the same Bible said the love of money yes. is the root of all evil. Yes. And the same Bible is yes. also saying that money answered all things. So if a layman is watching us right now, where yes. does this man place this Bible? <laughs> well, how, how do we have to balance this? Okay, well, this is where we have to understand that context is important. You know, so you have to look at the context of the statement that is being made. And again, the Bible is a multi-level device. It's written at many different levels. So if you pick up any passage, you might have a superficial understanding of it from first reading. But if you start to analyze what is in the passage, you'll find that there's much more in there than appears at first glance. So where does money fit in our lives? Well, your second um, quotation, that the love of money is the root of all evil, is, I think, the warning that we are given about our stance in relation to money. As I said earlier, it is a useful thing. Yeah, and Jesus didn't say, get rid of your money. What he said is, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. That also refers to the obligations that we have to our fellow man, whether it's the rent that you have to pay or the school fees you have to pay and so on. The best way or easiest way to do that is to use money. It's not the only way. In the past, there were societies that did barter. So if I needed something from uh, a farmer and maybe I'm a hunter, I will go and hunt something and then bring it to the farmer in exchange for the thing I wanted from the farmer. So we are compelled to live in a world where we exchange things with one another. And we have a choice as to what we exchange and how we do the exchange. The love of money is the root of all evil. What that is saying is that if we focus solely on getting money, then in essence we are selling our souls to the devil. Because it is also said, yeah, no man can serve two masters. So we have to make that choice whether we are trying to be of service or whether we are trying to be uh, to others or whether we are trying to be of service only to ourselves. And the greed for money, the love of money, really is just a service to oneself. It's not a service to anybody else. If you are going for money or you are trying to make money in order to use that to help other people, that's a different kettle of fish. But then the question, the, the issue there is that your priority is helping other people. 
Yeah, that is what you love. Getting the money is simply the means to that end. So you are okay with that. If you don't get as much money, then maybe you can't do as much good. But your priority, your focus, your love is on doing good. And this, I think, is what we should understand. Your third statement <laughs> that uh, money answereth all things, I think that needs to be um, understood in terms of human society. If you as an individual have hunger, pangs, and uh, <laughs> you don't have anything to eat, you have a problem. Maybe money can solve that problem. If there are people who have uh, money, uh, uh, food, and are willing to sell it to you. But if you're in a situation where there is famine in the land and there's no food to be had, having all the money in the world is not going to solve that problem. It won't solve that problem for you. You are watching the biggest. I, 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 won't ask, I wanted to understand someone who has a car shop selling cars, plenty of it. Yes. It's, um, it's the person's money. Yes. Have been ab in a cars, so cars. Mm -hmm. Someone is also selling tomatoes, and someone doesn't even have a one tomato for pepper. Yes. So we, we will talk about that, and maybe some other time. Because when I ask, it's going to be, and your topic is a huge one. So I will leave it here. Okay. But let me ask this: so we go right now, as you are sitting here. Yes. Where do we place you? Are you a Christian? Are you an atheist? Are you a Buddhist? Are you a Hindu? I want to know what you are. What are your beliefs? Your beliefs. So I'm able to ask questions about what you are coming to teach us. <laughs> I'm a seeker after truth. We seek after the truth. After truth. Truth comes in uh, in, in many expressions. Yeah, there's a story about the six blind men of Hindustan. And in this story, we have these six blind guys who are very interested in learning about the world. So one day a friend comes along and says, oh, today I'm going to take you guys to experience an elephant. Yeah? So he leads them to where the elephant is. And they start feeling for the elephant. So everybody is standing there somewhere and they experience the elephant for some time. And then the friend comes back and says, OK, if you've had enough, now it's time to go home. So on the way home, they started discussing their experiences. And one of them said, oh, what a mighty beast is an elephant. It's like a house, very solid, and you can hardly push it and it's up there. And another said, ah, uh, my friend, I don't know where you've been, but the elephant that I experienced, no, it's like a tree. The thing was planted in the ground and it was straight and very steady and you couldn't move it. And the third said, hey, you guys, have you been drinking something or what? Because an elephant is nothing like that. It's like a rope. It's just long and was hanging on something and when I felt it, it was just moving around. It's like a rope. And a fourth said, oh, no, 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 no. People, I don't know where you guys have been, but an elephant? It's like a banana leaf. It's a flat, flappy different thing. Different people and, so and different the way they see things. Thank you. One truth, the elephant. But because of limited experience, limited visibility, understanding, understanding and so on, everybody had a different perspective. Yeah? And this is how it has been with most religions in the world today. Everybody has a different perspective and they say the this is the only thing. Way. Yes. Um, I like the two commandments that Jesus came to leave with us. And I think those two commandments, they answer everything. Which is? Love thy God with all thy heart and soul and mind. And love thy neighbor as, yourself. as thyself. This is one of the understandings of the cross. So you are a truth seeker. When they yes. say this one, someone is 
a, a, a truth seeker. Yes. Who is that person? Well, it's somebody who wants to bring the light and understanding of God into the world. And to you make use you life you, better for others. You you keep you keep quoting from the Bible. Yes. So is your Bible is the Bible your source? It's one of my sources. One of your source yes. means there are others. Well, I mentioned nature. There's much in nature that can teach us a lot. So you let's say nature, the Bible. Yes. Can yes. you add some other source? No, no, no. There are other books. The the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, <laughs> the, even the Quran and so on, um, they all have some truth in them. The thing to do is to use discernment yeah, to elicit the truths that are in these sources. All these books that you just mentioned, your topic is huge, so I want to stop this random, so we go straight into your to topic, but you keep saying things that deserve or that brings some questions mm -hmm. into mind mm -hmm. because when you say bible um quran and bhagavad gita and mm -hmm. the rest of the book has some truth in it yes when you say they have some truth in it are you yes. saying they equally have some lies in it it's quite possible i haven't examined those books from a to z <laughs> so i couldn't say but I do know from what the exposure I've had to them that there are truths in them. There are truths in them. Yes. So, so um, are you in any of these fraternities or you stand alone? I stand with God. I know you stand, <laughs> all these people stand with but God. <laughs> By the grace of God, none of them has said, yeah. ever said that he stands mm. with Mammon. <laughs> <laughs> But I want to know whether, wha mm. you, whether you are with any of these fraternities. Well, that's a slightly difficult question to answer. Um, I would say yes and no. No in the sense that I don't, I'm not full-time, 100% with any particular. But you are half-time with one of them. Uh, I'm not, well, I'm part-time. Uh, like. Of one of them. Which with, one? With, with, with all of them. In other <laughs> words, <laughs> in other words, I'm I'm as comfortable with the, with a the Hindu, with a Hindu, as I am comfortable with a Muslim. But in that relationship, I'm dealing with them or I'm approaching them as another child of God. What religion they are really isn't very important. So you are part time of all of these people. Well, now what we have to understand is that. Yeah, people often confuse religion with spirituality. Yeah? And the reality is that religions tend to divide people. They tend to separate people. Because the f those who inherited those religions from the founders, invariably they'll say this is the only true way to God. Because, of course, they want to increase their followers. So they will put... Uh, misunderstandings in their congregation, in their followers, about other religions. Oh, that one is a false religion. Don't go there. Stay here. Okay. And this brings about div division and separation, um, which is not what God wants. Spirituality, on the other hand, okay, ignores all of these trappings of the rituals if you like, that people go through. And spirituality will deal with everybody on the same footing, the same basis. You are a child of God, I am a child of God. What can we do for each other today? Okay, so right now, the part-time. Yes. Uh, I want to know which of these people are you <laughs> really rhyming or vibing with? I'm vibing with the truth in them. Let me give you an example. Yeah. The uh, Hindus have a trinity, Vishnu, Shiva, and um, Brahma, or Brahmin. And these three represent the creator, the destroyer, the preserver. Yeah? These three also have correlations or correlates in the world we live in. They are talking about positive, negative, and neutral. 
the atoms from which we are made also have positive, negative, and neutral. They've got protons, electrons, and neutrons. So in the Hindu pantheon, these three key gods, if you like, represent the polarities of this universe yeah, that we live in, that we experience every day. The equipment we have here is plugged into an electric socket, which has got three poles, positive, negative, and neutral. So there's a truth in there that is, uh, expresses the nature of things. Okay. But Do you believe in anything? Oh, yes. Because I want to know where you, you are part-time you are part-timing with <laughs> whether the Hindus if you say the Hindus I'll know where to direct my question when you say Christians okay you part-time with all of them where do you spend your time the most so I'm able to see where you stand there you go now do go do. <laughs> <laughs> now that's focusing on what's important mm -hmm. what's important is this you know uh, somebody sent me a, a picture once and uh, there was a caption on the picture it said the universe only pretends to be made of matter. Secretly, it is made of love. And I thought that was the most profound statement because that is the reality. The universe is made of love. And it's another way of saying that the universe, creation, is the mind of God, the consciousness of God, which we experience when we get on the right frequency, which we experience as love. Yeah? Now, that consciousness pervades all of creation. You know, we talk about God being omnipresent, but we don't really, we haven't really understood or embody that understanding. So if I say God is present, it is, it is also present here in this paper. How? By the laws of creation that hold the universe together, this thing has been made. And those laws emanate from God. And therefore, its very existence and the way it continues to hold itself together is by the grace of God the laws of God. Therefore, God is here. God is here. You still didn't make your stand where you actually partner with them, but you, it's okay. Well, so where's your destination? No, let, 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 let me go back to that then. You know, I said that um, I'm, what I find most resonant in all of the scriptures is those two commandments of Jesus, both of which speak of love. Love thy God, as you understand it to be, mm -hmm. all of creation, and love thy neighbor as thyself. So now what's your destination when you die from here? <laughs> what's your destination? Well, let me uh, make reference to an episode in the Bible where Jesus is You asking, quote the Bible. Are you, I, are you, are I, you I like the Bible. partnering them more? Oh, yeah, yeah. But, uh, but that should be obvious by now. <laughs> <laughs> it should be obvious by now. You are watching the biggest. <laughs> Okay, continue. So okay. are you going to heaven? If that should be obvious by now. Let, let me are answer. you going to heaven? I'm trying to answer that. Okay. Okay, because heaven is a construct which has been created, yeah, in contradistinction to hell. And <laughs> we need to understand that that construct doesn't make sense. Which one? The idea of heaven and hell. It doesn't make sense? No, it doesn't. Are you saying it doesn't make sense or it makes sense? I'm saying it doesn't make, make sense. sense. To and who? Let me explain why. Uh, it doesn't make sense to who? To me. Ah, okay. Go but let me explain why it doesn't make sense. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because the idea of hell, yeah, which is a place mm -hmm. which is governed and ruled by Satan. Yeah. Which means that the presence of God is not there. 
Now, <clears throat> if it is an all-powerful God, an omnipresent God, how can there be somewhere in the universe that he is not present? That he is not present. Hmm. That he doesn't have the power. <clears throat> and if he is present, what kind of God is it that is prepared to let people suffer in eternity? His own creation. Will in hellfire. In hellfire for all eternity. Ah! What kind of God is that? Because I don't want to be a part of that kind of God. You don't want to be a part? Do you of have a not, choice? Not of that kind of God, no. I have a choice mm. in what I believe. Yeah? And this is what I'm saying. The idea of hell doesn't make sense to me. So, me... Let's leave it I, there. I, I don't worry So, what's about your it. destination? My destination is, as Jesus asked his disciples once upon a time, what do men say I am? Yeah? And I don't know if you remember the answers he got. He said, oh, some say... They some say that you are and Moses, one said you are yeah. the child, you are the son of God. That was the second time. That was the second question. When they came up with the names of the dead prophets. Okay. Now, <clears throat> we often sometimes have to look at what is not said to understand what's going on. As much as we look at what is said. And in this particular encounter, what struck me was the fact that Jesus did not berate his disciples for suggesting that he was a reincarnation of dead prophets. He said, okay, but who do you say I am? That's when they said, oh, you are the son of God. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there is this idea that life is a continuous and repeating spectrum or process. We come, we incarnate on this planet, we spend time here, we die, we go back into the spirit realm and maybe reincarnate somewhere else or somewhere else. So I believe that when I die, my soul will be absorbed back into the supreme consciousness that we call God. That is all. I will go back to We just wanted God. to know your destination. Whether, whether you choose to call it heaven or hell or Istanbul or Paris, that's <laughs> Istanbul, you know, what do you So I'm watching the biggest <laughs> and the largest. Uh, we, we, we understand you now. We know where you are coming from. So your topic is Christ. Consciousness. Well, uh, Christ consciousness, actually. Christ consciousness yes. and the yeah, coming yeah. crisis. Is any crisis coming? We are in a crisis. It's okay. likely to get worse. <coughs> That's your topic. Yes. So take us through, please. Okay. I s started by saying that there is a, th th uh, uh, an age-long conflict between Mammon and Mana. Uh, because, and the Bible says this, that Satan wants to take over the world. Yeah? That has been his dream and his ambition. And he's been working towards that very diligently. And we have come to a time where because of technology and what it is able to do, we have come to a time where Satan is in prospect of being able to take control of everybody and everything in the world through a handful of people who have, as it were, dedicated themselves to the designs of Satan. These are certain bloodlines that have survived through the ages and are amongst us today and are controlling much of what happens today from behind the scenes. But that control is leading the world to a place where you and I will cease to have the um, autonomy, the personal autonomy and freedom that God granted to every human being. That is a crisis 
that we're heading towards. Some people call it the globalist agenda. Yeah, uh, but there are many strands to it. The two key strands, however, are one, the digitalization of identities, where there's a move throughout the world, where there's a move throughout the world to give everybody a digital ID. Those digital IDs will reside in uh, cyberspace, which along with surveillance technologies will allow those who control the cy that cyberspace to track everybody in the world and what they are doing. The second thing that is also bringing matters to a head is the idea of central bank digital currencies. What lies behind that is the abolition of money as we know it to be replaced by digital money which is controlled by people whom we do not know. But basically they are the ones who will manage the central banks or control the central banks. What this means is that because that digital money will be programmable, yeah, what this means is that if somebody does not like, uh, if somebody says the wrong thing or does a wrong thing that the authorities do not like, okay, they can disenfranchise that person. They can freeze their accounts and prevent them from being able to buy or sell or engage in any commerce and so on. Does that sound familiar? Hmm. Because Revelations warns about this, warns us against this, that there will come a time, and they call it the mark of the beast, when if you don't have the mark of the beast, you will not be able to engage in society. Unless you become an outlaw and you grow your own food and so on, you will not survive. That is where the world is heading to. And very few people seem to be aware that this is going so that is essentially the coming crisis. <coughs> there will be a number of things that will happen before we get to that point. Which is? Yeah. Which is quite likely the escalation of World War III. Okay. Let us remember the objective of Satan is one world government. One world government. And this is something that has been advertised in plain sight since 1935. Why am I saying this? If you permit me, okay, I just take out a dollar bill. And most people are familiar with a one dollar bill. What most people may not be familiar with is the writing under that pyramid, yeah, which says Ordo no, uh, Novus Seclorum. The Latin phrase, a Latin phrase meaning a new world order. And the devil and his people have been advertising this since 1935. They have to do that because, as you may know, humanity has free will. And what this means is that nothing can force us to do anything we don't want to do. So for us to uh, accept for something to be done, the devil uses subterfuge. Okay. He has to get our permission. <coughs> and he does that by making known what his intention is, but in a way that we don't take serious note of it. And you know in law there's a phrase, silence implies consent. If we don't object to what the devil is proposing, then basically the devil takes it that we have given our consent and he can go ahead. Okay. And how so do we object that? How do we object to yes. it? Yes. Well, one of the things that is happening is the BRICS consortium. Yeah. This dollar that I showed you 
is the de facto reserve currency of the world. So up until recently, basically everybody used the dollar to do the international settlements and so on. BRICS has come along and said, no, we don't want to use a dollar. Let's put together something different, okay? Because that dollar, yeah, is issued by the U.S. Federal Reserve. Many people think of the U.S. Federal Reserve as the central bank for the U.S., but it is not the central bank for the U.S. It is what? It is a private institution. It's a private organization. It is not owned by the United States government. It is owned by private individuals. And the, you know, it says on the dollar bill that this thing belongs to the US Federal Reserve, not the US Treasury, the US Federal Reserve. And so if you hold it, then you owe the US Federal Reserve. And when the issue dollar notes with an interest rate attached and so on and so forth. The U.S. population are expected to pay that interest rate. This is why they can talk about the U.S. The United States of America owing 31 trillion dollars. Who do they owe it to? The people who issue their currency. And that power, that monopoly power that they have, and they have had this since 1913, hmm. yeah, is what has enabled them to gain control over much of the world because they have the license to print as much money as they decide they need. Mm. And they printed money and instigated World War I, the outcome of which was the League of Nations. Okay, so they brought in the idea that, oh, if you know, to avoid large-scale war and so on, we should have a situation where the nations come together. So they set up the League of Nations. That was step one. It didn't take long before they instigated also World War II. Out of World War II, same narrative, oh, you know, this business of wars, we have to stop it. Let's all get together. Out of that came the United Nations and the Bretton Woods institutions. And, you know, we have been taught that the United Nations is a great organization and um, is there for the betterment of humanity and for peace and all the rest of it. And it's a lie. Huh? It is a lie. It is a lie. It is a lie. Please, what do you mean? <laughs> the United Nations is an organization that is controlled by these bloodline families that what, what, what are the bloodlines what who are those people well, we want to know who, who are these those are people who because of uh, time circumstance connections and so on okay have come to a position where they are influential in the world are, are you talking about the dracos uh no that's a race of people. I'm talking about humans here. I'm talking about the Rothschilds. I'm talking about the Rockefellers. I'm talking about uh, um, hmm. the Fords. Most of them have got foundations the attached black to their names. Mm -hmm. yeah. And these foundations are the vehicles through which they do philanthropic works to bamboozle people into thinking that they are They good. are for good? Yes, but they are not. They are not. Okay. Hey. <laughs> so this is the world we live in. That so the crisis consciousness yes. and this crisis that is coming, yeah. how do we balance ourselves? How can we rectify the situation? That is if it's possible. We oh. Should we just be there? It is possible. And so what and what are we supposed to do? Well, we follow the two commandments, love thy God and love thy neighbor as thyself, and cultivate the essence of love, which will push out the essence of fear. Yeah, we are not made to be fearful. And it, that also is in the Bible. But what a lot of people don't understand is that everything has its antithesis, thesis, antithesis. 
you know, uh, everything has its opposites. And people think that the opposite of love is hate, it's but it isn't. The no. opposite of love is fear. Think of a magnet, yeah? Love is a force that brings things together. Like when you have opposing poles mm, of a magnet. Close. Fear is Open. what drives things apart, okay? And much of what happens in the world today is driven by fear. You just listen to any politician trying to get elected. They will put fear into the electorate against their opponent, mm -hmm. against the uh, uh, immigrants, against some. They will put fear into people in order to get them running, hopefully, for sanctuary. And mm -hmm. this is what drives our world. Mm -hmm. Okay. Not love, fear. So a good example, recent example of that was the COVID pandemic or scamdemic, okay, where people were frightened by false narratives yeah. into by false narratives into allowing themselves to be injected by a very insidious and evil poison. These mRNA, mRNA vaccines are bioweapons. I'm saying this here on this platform. They're bioweapons which have started to lead to excess deaths in especially the most highly vaccinated populations in the global north. And but why, why would they do that? Because they want to depopulate the world to make it more manageable. Okay. Some of the people behind this thing are eugenicists. You might remember Hitler came with this idea of racial purity. Three millions. He wanted to get rid of the Jews. After the Jews, he started to get rid of the blacks and so on. That idea is something that a number of people in very influential places and who were also part of the setting up of the United Nations have this idea that <laughs> humanity, we are too many, and some of us don't deserve to be here. They are playing God. And you may have heard of the Georgia Guidestones. Mm. Okay? This is something like uh, a monument that was erected in 1980 in uh, Eldred County in Georgia, USA. Georgia is the granite capital, as it were, of the U.S. So they had this monument e erected, which, and it served as, uh, as a compass, as a calendar, and um, a, a chronometer. So <coughs> this monument they erected had what looked like Ten Commandments, a new Ten Commandments for humanity. Okay? The first of those commandments was humanity should endeavor to keep the total population of the globe, of the world, below 500 million. 500 million. This was at a time when the population of the Earth was 5 billion. 5 billion. Almost 10 percent, 9% they were are going to be... No, 90%. They were planning to get rid of 90% of mm -hmm. the world. And this is where these bioweapons come in. Fortunately, <laughs> for they are us saying our time is even gone. Okay. Well, these are the crises that are upcoming. Okay, give and us five stretches and your advice to the public. Five stretches to, um, I mean, to maybe correct the error or to keep away or to reduce the damages that can happen to us. Five mm -hmm. stretches. Ladies and gentlemen, we go back to the two commandments of Christ. Learn how to love your God and the environment in which you live. Show some respect. Learn to love your neighbor as yourself. Because indeed, like the fingers of this one hand that look to be separate, your neighbor is not separate from you. He is connected to you if you look at the whole hand. And each of us has a micro, 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 micro franchise of the consciousness of God. We are of God. 
We have God within us. We need not fear our fellow human being. We should learn to trust, we should learn to love, we should learn to apply our minds and our brains and our hearts and hands to produce a service that will earn us the money and the financial security that we serve. Praying to God is not uh, something that should be used <laughs> for money because money is not of God, it is of the devil. Mm -hmm. So reserve your prayers for improving yourself, improving your family and friends and so on for the good things and for help in, in, in upgrading, yeah, uplifting your spirit and your capabilities and your sensitivities. We also need to be very mindful that it's not everything that you see on TV or you read in the papers that is correct. Exactly. We all know today that there's a lot of um, uh, fake news going around and we should be aware. Uh, we should be very wary of uh, vaccination programs because this is one of the key methodologies that the globalists are going to use, are using to depopulate the planet. Okay. Um, I can't think what else to say that would <laughs> be of immediate okay. benefit to listeners but mm, i think we appreciate you thank you so much so should we pray oh definitely should we, we should pray yes okay me i think my questions are were not finished i don't know if you will give him the second chance so i can ask the rest of my questions i didn't finish my questions so but papa thank you so much for coming they are saying our time is due we appreciate you is there any social media is there anywhere people would get through to you in case they want to ask you questions and all that unfortunately i'm not on really on social media you are not on yeah, social media no. so um, I, I would suggest that uh, people visit youtube and look for channels that talk about reincarnation reincarnation yes because there are a number of channels i think one of them is called something like heaven can wait okay where people like you and me have had post-death experiences, they call them near-death, but they really are post-death, where people have transitioned into the spirit realm, okay, having maybe had a heart attack or whatever it is, they have died clinically, but their consciousness has transitioned into the spirit realm where they meet with various entities and so on, and they have come back to tell the tale, okay? There's a great consistency in what people experience in these things. So that should give us all a deeper insight. Um, how I wish I could ask him why he thinks we should go and uh, um, um, watch reincarnation channels and who is responsible for reincarnations. But our time is due. Papa, thank you so much for coming. We do appreciate you. Thank you so, so, so much. And also the Nadia, but we keep moving, we keep learning till we get there. Thank you so much for watching. I'm always your annoying host. Shalom.